Well, I think from the perspective of the ICJ, this is the most important decision it's ever made. And it has restored a certain kind of confidence that international procedures can sometimes reach clear results. And what made the decision, I think, uh, so uh, f favorable and jurisprudentially significant is that on this very controversial set of issues, it reached near unanimity. That there was, I mean, the Uga Ugandan judge is sort of an anomaly, and the two ad hoc judges were the only uh, exception to a unanimous view. And this meant that the judges did not follow the national flag. They followed their uh, juridical conscience, and they acted as um, jurists and appropriately uh, interpreting the legal ramifications of the Genocide Convention, a very important uh, text in international legal life, but one that is rarely uh, applied in an effective way. Whether the results will be respected is, of course, probably your second question. Yeah. But uh, uh, even, even if uh, Israel and its supporters uh, pr prevent the implementation and enforcement of the uh, rulings on these provisional measures, it will activate civil society activism and it will uh, reinforce the impression of Western imperialism and uh, Israeli defiance of international law and will uh, point to the degree to which countries in this Western configuration uh, are, are unwilling to accept accountability for their behavior. And that's, Israel will pay a high price whether they comply or whether they don't comply. So in that sense, this is a historic ruling at a time of humanitarian crisis of a really severe sort, not only because of the genocide in Gaza, but because the countries that purport to be the guardians of liberal values have actually uh, endorsed genocide and acted as enablers, what I call complicity crimes. And that is a direct assault on the idea that the uh, Convention on Genocide uh, is explicitly directed toward its prevention and punishment. And it's, it's a very uh, crucial moment internationally and in relation, of course, to the fate of the Palestinian people. No crystal ball is very clear at this moment because there are a lot of uncertainties, tactical uncertainties about how uh, Israel will try to maneuver in response to this uh, set of rulings and how uh, the Biden presidency in the United States will deal with what I think is its greatest policy dilemma uh, since uh, Biden came to the White House, which is that he seems 
unable to confront uh, either the Zionist uh, infrastructure, which is very powerful in Washington with Congress and uh, the think tanks and Pentagon uh, Middle East people, and he's opposed by a growing majority of people in his own party in, a, in an election year for a second term for his own presidency. So uh, it's, it sort of appears to be a lose-lose uh, situation that confronts uh, Biden. And if anything, Trump, the alternative to Biden, is uh, equally dangerous and irresponsible. And uh, one fears what his kind of uh, turbulent temperament would produce. Uh, so the question really becomes one, can the people control their own government? And that's a question for more and more societies, not just a press question for the U.S. And at the moment, it's not very encouraging, I think, even though there's been an unprecedented shift in favor of uh, supporting the ICJ, supporting the Palestinian struggle, opposing uh, Israel's policies, still the center-right is much more mobilized than is the uh, more progressive uh, sec sectors of American society. American youth is a, a glimmer of hope because they do see the world in a more unified way they're worried about climate change. They, they don't want to uh, engage in policies that uh, are incompatible with their values and their sense of a desirable future. But whether the youth can tr translate themselves into a political force sufficient to transform American political life is uncertain. At the present, I, as a lifetime American, feel, uh, I don't really feel I'm part of a viable democracy. I have the feeling of alienation and disenfranchisement that I w describe for my own benefit as one of inner exile. You know, I'm physically present, but not psychopolitically in engaged because there are no viable alternatives. Well, I, I think that uh, the most that you can do in the short run is to try to use what power you have as a, in some ways, a citizen of a free society. And if you can ac accumulate enough support, you can challenge maybe the established order. It will take some unexpected shock to really shift the balance of forces so sufficiently so that one gets a transformative impact. Because aside from the connection with Israel, there's the problem of a deeply rooted militarism that's within the bureaucracy and in the private sector through the arms industry which has a vested interest in exaggerating threats and, and uh, in engagement in wars and 
uh, regime change interventions, and that's going to be very difficult to dislodge because it's tied to the uh, way in which wealth is unequally distributed, and it, the, the, it, it also illustrates part of the trage political tragedy of the Palestinian people that when you have the um, pressure groups from civil society on one side and there's a vacuum on the other side, it's very hard for politicians to go against those pressures. And the, and the uh, Palestinians, uh, despite having many gifted uh, individuals among their ranks, have never been able to form a network of influence that can, in some sense, neutralize this uh, powerful Zionist pro uh, Israeli lobby, and, and uh, that's also true for the military. The military is a kind of bipartisan. The two parties are in consensus on both these issues, on both the uh, unwavering support for Israel and the unwavering support for a wartime budget in, in a period of peace. And those two obstacles, I think, have to be somehow circumvented to create a new political atmosphere that will allow creative, more uh, benevolent forces to emerge. The settler colonial experience is such that you either have to eliminate the native population or s totally marginalize them like the American Indians in, in the US and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, or you, or you end up losing like uh, in uh, South Africa, Algeria, uh, uh, some other places, Indochina maybe, uh, where colonialism backed by a settler uh, ambition uh, needs to be genocidal to carry its project to a successful end. And, and the Palestinians have been extraordinary in their steadfastness to an identity that is willing to accept this onslaught of suffering over many decades. It's an extraordinary exploit of a sort. I was very influenced myself by the Vietnam uh, experience. I went to North Vietnam twice during the Vietnam War, and I experienced uh, the willingness of the Vietnamese, ordinary Vietnamese people uh, to make incredible sacrifices to uh, control their own destiny. And it was part of the, an atmosphere where colonialism was disintegrating, but the colonial power backed by U.S. imperial power uh, made it very costly to obtain liberation. And Israel comes along at a time when colonialism has collapsed everywhere and es tries to establish uh, against the flow of history and therefore encountering uh, uh, very deep-rooted resistance which requires very uh, harsh repression. So apartheid was the first stage of that harsh repression Genocide, in my view, is the culmination of apartheid. If apartheid doesn't work and you're not willing to make the kind of Mandela accommodation with, which he did in South Africa, the only alternative is uh, genocide or surrender. 
and I think we're close to that position, closer in, anyway, uh, than at any time uh, during my lifetime. Yes, uh, I think that any kind of objective view would at least cast deep suspicion on the leadership that they knew something. They might not have known the exact blueprint, although, you know, the New York Times had a front page story which said that the Israeli military and political leadership had a year's warning of pretty much the exact contours of the campaign. So it's hard to imagine that they didn't have at least enough um, sense of prudence to have uh, increased border security. And the fact that they didn't, and with all their uh, super t uh, surveillance technology, that they didn't uh, contain this uh, uh, incursion which occurred in 22 different places uh, seems uh, hard to uh, rationalize, hard to accept that the official version is the real version. And it's, this is reinforced, I think, by the fact that what, how they reacted was not con consonant with a security preoccupation. If they were really concerned with security, the first thing they would do is try to improve their own uh, border protection and, one, and in, conduct an investigation of how this happened. And secondly, take account of the fact that even though uh, uh, Gaza has been uh, occupied since 1967, there's never been another incident. They've actually had, uh, as these things go, uh, incredible border security. And in fact, the real uh, violation of security was from the Israeli side, these military incursions that occurred uh, every few years uh, in the 21st century uh, created a, a sense of acute insecurity within uh, Gaza. And what people often um, exclude from their understanding is the, that the Netanyahu government, long before October 7th, uh, was widely known, including in Washington, as the most extreme government ever to rule. And what made it extreme was an ethnic cleansing scenario to gain sovereign control, not over Gaza, which was thought to be not so important, but in the West Bank, where the leadership gave a green light to settler violence from the very first day it was in office, distributed weapons to the s settlers and uh, seemed to be saying to Palestinians living in occupied territories, leave or we'll kill you. And that kind of message, of course, is one that uh, uh, can only be met by a very deep attachment to the land and to the struggle to uh, do whatever is necessary uh, to persist and prevail.